My name is Sugu. I uh, work at uh, the YouTube infrastructure team um, at uh, Google. Um, I've been I've been at YouTube since uh, now for over ten years now, uh, and uh, I've been working on uh, the Vitesse project since uh, 2010, its inception. So over seven years of development uh, on this project, uh, and uh, it feels like I'm just getting started. So. Um, <clears throat> what is uh, Vitesse? Uh, this is actually uh, our mission statement uh, that uh, we have been kept tuned. It's to be the best performing, scalable, and most available new SQL storage solution in the cloud based on MySQL. And um, it also uh, very closely describes uh, what Vitesse is and uh, what it intends to do. Uh, a new SQL term is something that we added recently because uh, there are now many solutions that uh, try to do what uh, Vitesse is doing now, except we didn't have a name for it then, now there is a name for it. Um, uh, so if you, for those of you who don't know what, uh, what is NewSQL, uh, this is a chart that shows uh, the database landscape. Um, on uh, one side, uh, we have uh, RDBMSs, the traditional RDBMS, uh, MySQL, Postgres, uh, uh, mainframes, uh, Oracle, IBM, and also the uh, new generation RDS, Cloud SQL, etc. They all fall into the uh, left category, and uh, uh, the their strength is actually uh, uh, how how strong they are with data support. Uh, they give you transactions and a lot of cool stuff that you can do with the data. But where they fall short is on uh, scalability or scaling out, the, the only solution you usually can do is scale up, basically buy bigger and bigger hardware. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have um, uh, uh, NoSQL databases. Uh, they scale awesome, uh, but where they fall short is uh, with data features. Uh, you can't do transactions, indexes, joins, so all those things are missing there. And uh, typically, the, and there's been this huge gap between these two worlds. Uh, which now the what we call as new SQL is trying to fill. Um, basically, the new SQL data stores give you uh, scalability like a NoSQL data store, uh, and but also try to give you some RDBMS features like transactions, indexes, etc. And in this category, uh, there's a Cockroach, there's TIDB. Um, actually, they have a booth here. There's a, a Spanner. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, Vitesse is uh, also in this category. Um, so this is, uh, um, so th the way I would put it is, uh, where, where people ask like, uh, how does Vitesse compare with uh, Spanner, and how does it compare with Cockroach? I would say, well, this area is so big that uh, we should be asking new SQL versus RDBMS, or new SQL versus no SQL because there is enough opportunity for everyone, because we actually need multiple products uh, in this area to be able to uh, satisfy the needs of people that are coming in. Um, so this is kind of uh, the marketing of Vitesse. Um, and somebody would ask, if somebody were to say, okay, what is, why is it that people should use Vitesse over even Cockroach? Like, tell me why. Then this, this would be what I would answer with. Uh, the main thing that Vitesse gives you is it's uh, production hardened. And there's actually a, a MySQL SRE here who would uh, um, vouch for it from, uh, from Google. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's, been, it's taken a lot of beating at uh, YouTube, and it is now super strong. Um, we're, so you have no fear of taking Vitesse into production. Uh, we have uh, Huge QPS, huge scalability, worldwide deployment, uh, comfortable five nines of availability. Um, so all those cool things that you expect from a production system, uh, Vitesse can fulfill. But uh, the most exciting part of Vitesse is that it is based on MySQL. So, uh, and it automatically inherits all its strengths. Uh, performance, latency, uh, efficiency. So all those things we get uh, that uh, you are, um, you've uh, learned to grow with uh, MySQL, you get that for free with Vitesse. And uh, uh, more importantly, what you can do is, if you already have a MySQL instance, you can uh, deploy Vitesse on top of it, and then uh, go shard your database underneath, 
and with very little changes to the application, which is uh, the reason uh, why Vitesse is beginning to attract um, a lot of attention. Uh, the other uh, uh, awesome feature, which actually uh, many Vitesse users also don't know, is what I found out, is that the sharding is 100% pluggable, which means that if you're already sharded, you can basically bring your sharding scheme to Vitesse and we'll accommodate you, no problem. And uh, last but not the least, uh, Vitesse runs in a large number of environments, GCE, GKE, AWS, uh, we are now looking at RDS, uh, there's bare metal uh, and various uh, mesos, Kubernetes. Uh, people are running it in all kinds of uh, uh, weird environments, and uh, it's been doing well in all of them. So this this is basically uh, uh, why Vitesse has been uh, uh, gaining uh, uh, a user base. Overall, like if you look at the total feature set of Vitesse, it's kind of uh, pretty wide. Uh, I've, um, I've tried to cover these in other talks, and uh, you can spend two hours just talking, going through all the features, so I'm going to uh, give them, give you a broad categorization, and then you can drill down as needed. Uh, the first area is cluster management. We, uh, we test lets you manage all your replicas, uh, multiple data centers, uh, failovers, uh, categories of uh, databases, a uh, lot of work in that area. Uh, the other uh, big uh, area is the resharding automation. Uh, pretty much in, Go in YouTube, we reshard all the time, like every, every couple of months there is a resharding project. And at this point, nobody even talks about it. So we say, oh, we need to reshard, you just go reshard, and developers don't even know that we did it. And, uh, uh, and as I mentioned, you what? Oh, you talk about it. That's because uh, you're an SRE. <laughs> you're the only one that talks about it. <laughs> And uh, uh, and in terms of query support, uh, uh, you can Vitesse now has this V3, what we call as V3, which lets you basically send your queries uh, directly without any hints and stuff. And we now have uh, native drivers for uh, most major languages: Java, PHP, uh, Python. Uh, but uh, the most exciting part, we announced 2.1 release yesterday, where uh, you don't even need those drivers because now you can just speak MySQL with uh, Vitesse. And uh, last but not the least, uh, production readiness. This is actually, um, uh, in some respect, uh, people uh, develop a product and then make it production ready. We did it the other way around. We made it production ready first and then added features to it. So at the core, Vitesse is super solid and um, uh, and um, it gives you a lot of support in production that you have not had before. Like if you are, you see suddenly there is a spike in traffic, we just can handle it. If there is a, suddenly a user that's misbehaving, misbehaving, we can rate limit them, we can blacklist queries, or it can tell you, oh, by the way, this query suddenly has sh shown up in our graphs and uh, you need to look at who's sending it. So it has support for all these cool things. I'm going to actually rush ahead uh, because what I want to do is actually show you a demo. Uh, so I'm going to skip to the slides. This is kind of the architecture uh, of Vitesse. Uh, the, uh, the main thing that I would highlight at is you see that uh, HCD that's on top, which is a lock server. And um, uh, because Vitesse is meant to, for like thousands of servers of deployment, uh, there needs to be a place where you keep track of uh, what is where and what is what. And uh, that's where we put our information. Uh, Vitesse can actually integrate with all existing popular log servers, not just etcd. You can use Zookeeper, you can use console, and uh, there's also something called Chubby that we integrate with, uh, that you might have heard of. <laughs> and um, uh, the other uh, characteristic of this uh, architecture is the VT gate is actually a stateless server, and that's the server that uh, the app connects to. Um, it is so stateless that you can start a transaction with one VT gate and complete it using another one. Uh, and uh, uh, the advantage of this architecture is that you can scale your uh, VT gates up and down based on your traffic, which actually I believe uh, Robert will uh, probably talk about how he uses it for uh, uh, automatic scaling up and down. Um, uh, otherwise, the main, uh, the main purpose of this architecture is to keep the number of moving parts to a minimum. So, um, 
This is, uh, this, I thought we'll drill down on this particular topic because uh, a lot of people have asked about um, uh, sharding and how it works. Uh, the first thing is uh, when, uh, if you look in the industry, if you say sharding, the first question that you ask is, what is the sharding key, right? In our, in our opinion, we don't think that's the right question for, uh, to ask of a database. Because sharding key is a NoSQL concept, and the reason why you ask what is your sharding key is because you have only one key in a NoSQL database. But if, in a, if, you are, if, you have, if you're working on a relational database, you have more than just one key. You have primary keys, you have secondary indexes, uh, some of them are unique and non-unique. Uh, there's things like foreign keys. So when you, when you have a full relational database that you're running and you want to shard it, uh, it is uh, the pro the pro the solution is not to just think of sharding key. You have to think of all these other things that you have inside your database, and you need to find solutions for uh, for all those things. And that is where I think uh, Vitesse has um, uh, got the right design in mind uh, to be able to address all these problems. So the way we do uh, sharding in Vitesse is that every row has a um, what we call the key space ID assigned to it, and we range, uh, range shard based on that key space ID. But what makes it different is that that ID is actually not a physical column in your, um, in your database. Uh, in YouTube, actually, we have a physical column. That's what we started off with, but when, as the design evolved, we got rid of the need for actually a physical column. Instead, what we do is we allow you to define a mapping from your primary sharding key or sharding column into this key space ID. So this means that, uh, and this is actually a pluggable uh, interface, which means that we give you some predefined uh, algorithms like hashing, um, uh, whatever else you can think of. You can have mod-based sharding, you can have just identical, just use the key itself as the key space ID. Uh, but, uh, but more importantly, you can actually, um, define a new index uh, that says, okay, I want to use uh, MD5 hashing, I don't know, whatever uh, suits your fancy. And uh, I'm sure uh, Robert will talk more about that, so I'll um, uh, uh, go ahead. So the other challenge with uh, sharding is that um, as soon as you shard your data, auto-increment becomes a problem because how are you going to manage uh, uh, auto, how are you going to make auto-ink to uh, work if that is also your sharding key, right? So what we came up with is uh, something that we stole from Postgres, which is a sequence. Actually, not just Postgres. It's, it's an old database concept. Uh, it's a sequence where uh, which just gives you new IDs every time you do a select on the table. And, um, uh, and that's a super low latency, super efficient, um, under one millisecond probably, uh, uh, is how long it takes to generate a sequence. And it can go really, really high QPS. So we use that to, uh, uh, you, we, uh, we've developed that facility to generate sequences as needed and use them to uh, uh, populate your auto increment column. And, and it's implemented in such a way that it's backward compatible. So, and I'll show you a demo for it. Backward compatible as in it's backward compatible to the auto ink behavior of MySQL. And, uh, uh, and then, uh, Obviously, just using uh, a primary sharding key is insufficient to shard a database. Uh, so we, uh, Vitesse also supports uh, secondary indexes. Uh, they are basically cross-shard indexes, and it lets you maintain uh, the relationship between, uh, 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 basically it lets you index columns other than just the primary key. And uh, the way it implements it is uh, there is actually a backing table that keeps track of what maps to what. And because it is just another table, you can actually choose to shard that table if you like. So it's basically, it doesn't become, uh, the lookup table doesn't become uh, something of contention in the future. And not only that, because we allow you to plug in your own sharding, you can say, oh, I don't want to use a Vitesse table. I can, I think I should use Redis, uh, because Redis is good for these things. If you do that, you can just define a Vindex that uses the Redis, uh, and uh, you can use that as your uh, lookup table. So a very flexible design. Uh, Vitesse uh, initially was only used by YouTube, but now uh, we have a growing community. Uh, these are uh, 
uh, these are, this is actually not all the people, but some of the major uh, people that are using uh, Vitesse are, some of them have already gone into production, some of them are imminent, almost ready to go into production. Uh, and uh, uh, the exciting part is that not only are they using Vitesse, they are actually also contributing. Uh, each of, many of these companies have dedicated resources that are actually working almost full time on contributing to Vitesse, which is super exciting. <laughs> and um, uh, so you can see this list later. Uh, we just announced uh, 2.1 yesterday, uh, lots of uh, cool things. The one question that I always had when we announced V3 is when you have this, uh, when you have this cross chart index, you have, to uh, you have to update databases in multiple places. Uh, how are you going to take care of atomic transactions? So now we have 2PC, which we implemented using uh, a very innovative approach without using MySQL XA. Uh, and uh, there is a paper on our blog that you can read up on uh, about how we did it. Uh, pretty excited about that. Uh, someone asked for message queues. Uh, it is not Kafka. It is actually transactional uh, messaging for handling um, work, uh, queuing up work, and then taking care of it. Uh, uh, we now support row-based replication. Uh, MySQL protocol, you can now connect to Vitas using MySQL client and just send queries to it. Uh, and uh, the other one is the online schema swap, which allows you, uh, it works only for statement-based replication, but it allows you to uh, deploy sch uh, large schema changes without downtime uh, by playing the shell game with, uh, with the replicas. So these are some of the cool new features. Uh, looking ahead, uh, now that Vitesse uh, has grown beyond YouTube, uh, there are multiple stakeholders. We think that a better home for Vitesse is a foundation. So we have just uh, approached CNCF, and uh, talks are in progress and uh, uh, to uh, join them. And CNCF is a, a very good fit for us because uh, we are a cloud-friendly uh, uh, product. Uh, we released 2.1, and uh, our 3.0 focus is going to be how much closer to MySQL can we get? That's going to be our main challenge, uh, which is what we are going to focus on. <coughs> All right, so demo time. Uh, before I jump into the demo, uh, I wanted to uh, give you um, um, give you what I'm going to explain what I'm going to demonstrate. Uh, let's say there's this hypothetical company. I copied this from a, a popular company that allows you to upload videos and then other people can watch it. This is modeled after such a company, but to confuse everybody, I'm using music as the item that you upload. <laughs> so, so we have a user table, which, have, which have, uh, I'm only showing here uh, important uh, keys. I uh, assume these tables have 20 columns or so. Um, so there's a user table, which has a user ID. Um, and uh, users upload their music. So the music has a user ID and the music ID. And user ID is the foreign key, straightforward. And uh, there's additional metadata about each of this music. So there's an overflow table. Uh, detail table, uh, which is called music extra, whose foreign key is music ID. This is relational database 101, right? Now, uh, obviously, uh, if it was only 10 rows, no problem. But if you have uh, billions of rows, then you need to think about sharding. Uh, how do you shard this, right? For user, the answer is straightforward. Well, there's only one key, user ID. We are sharding by user ID. No question about it. But for music, you don't know. Uh, which one should you shard by, music ID or user ID? There's no correct answer, and the correct answer depends on uh, what's your use case, right? Do you often fetch uh, all the music uploaded by a user? In that case, you want to shard music by user ID. Or uh, do you have a case where each user could have 10 billion music videos? In which case, you probably don't want to shard your music table with your user ID, or do you mostly fetch music by music ID, then you want to shard by music ID. So in this particular case, I'm going to assume that we are sharding by user ID. Uh, and uh, music extra only needs music ID as a foreign key because it's a detailed table for, for music. But then you may ask the same question. Well, obviously, music extra has to live with the music row, right? Uh, because that's, it's, uh, it's additional information about that music. So how do you make this work under Vitesse? So if this was the thing, this would be user ID would be primary key, music ID would be primary key, 
user ID would be foreign key, so all that stuff we know. Uh, but when you decide to shard this, you have to basically build a sharding schema for this setup. You have to basically describe how you're going to shard these tables. The first thing you do, like I mentioned, is oh, user ID is sharded by, uh, is hash sharded, let's say, by, uh, by the user ID, straightforward. But we also need auto increment for user ID, so therefore I'm going to tie it to a sequence table, uh, which means that when I do an insert, it will go fetch the value from the sequence and then use that uh, in user ID. And uh, I'm going to say that music ID is also sharded by user ID. So they both uh, share the same uh, Vindex. Uh, Vindex stands for Vitesse Index. Uh, but then um, if I have also queries where I'm selecting by music ID, uh, those queries are not going to work well, right? Because they have to hit all shards. So what if I want that query to also work well? I'm going to define a Vindex on uh, music ID, uh, which means that uh, there is a secondary lookup table that's going to keep track of the key space IDs where uh, that music row lives. And Vitesse can auto-populate this for you. And uh, last but not the least, you're going to say music extra has to live with its music. Therefore, uh, music uh, uh, that should use the same mapping that music uses to figure out which row it should go to. It's essentially a foreign key, and you get that for free by saying that music ID and uh, music extra and music share the same lookup table. Right? So the 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 interesting thing here is uh, that music ID is the uh, primary Vindex key for uh, um, for um, music extra, user ID is a primary index key for user, uh, but you can join user to music to music extra, and uh, Vitesse will know that they all live in the same shard and will send the query to a single shard, and I'll show you a demo. Uh, hopefully I will have the time because I need to give time to Robert also. And finally, there is a sequence table for music also. All right, I'm going to jump into uh, our demo quickly. So, so the um, uh, before I jump into the demo, the the the, uh, the demo runs a binary called VT combo, which is Vitesse in a box, uh, and it is something that you can try it yourself at home. Uh, it is safe, <laughs> and uh, and I'll show you how how. Uh, so we built the demo using uh, using the same. Uh, the same thing. So this is, for example, um, the tree structure that we use for a demo. Under schema, you can see lookup and uh, and user. Um, lookup is a lookup database, and user is a, is a sharded user database. And each of those defines its own schema. And inside that, you will see that there is a vschema.json, which is basically the JSON representation of uh, the chart that I showed you. Uh, it kind of looks like this. I don't know if you can read it, but it doesn't matter. You can look this up. So the, what I have here is actually a very simplified version of the real demo that we have in our GitHub. Uh, uh, this is actually in the GitHub tree. Uh, just to show you what it can do, the demo actually shows a lot more capabilities that Vitesse can do, which I won't have time to cover today. So I'm just going to fire up the demo. Uh, just, by, just fire it up by just running run. And then once it is uh, ready, it should show me a URL that I can click, there you go. All right, should open the link. Uh, is the table readable for all of you? Maybe I should uh, scale it up. Oops. Ah, oh, there you go, got the key. Okay, is this better? Oh, it's too big. <laughs> oh, how do I make it smaller? Okay, okay, I'll stop here. So um, this is actually uh, uh, a representation of uh, the schema that I explained. Uh, the left two columns are shard zero of user. The middle two are uh, shard one of user. And the last one is your lookup database. 
In this case, the lookup database just has the sequences because uh, the lookup table that I talked about is also sharded in this case. <coughs> so, and uh, in this, I have a list of pre-cooked queries that you can run. Uh, the demo actually has a lot more tables and a lot more queries that you can try. So here I'm going to do an insert. I don't know if you can read it, but the insert statements only uh, has name in it. There is no user ID uh, in, the, in the insert statement. So if I run it, and, uh, eventually it should, if I run it at all. Oh, I think it's uh, taking its time. Okay, there you go, it ran, uh, except that uh, there is overlap. Uh -huh. <laughs> I hit enter twice. So I hit enter twice, so it ran that query twice, and uh, it auto-incremented, as you can see, user ID is one and two. Uh, the hash uh, sharding scheme uh, mapped that to shard zero. And uh, I'm going to change some values here, and uh, it says insert at least six times. The reason why it says six times is to show that as you insert, some rows go to shard zero and some go, rows go to uh, shard one. Um, and uh, you would notice in the user sequence table uh, that the next ID is gradually incrementing. The way we do this is actually we cache values and just dole them out as uh, requests come in. So it's very efficient. And uh, now that I've inserted rows, I can do a query. Uh, which is select where user ID equal to so and so. This is sharding 101. Uh, when you do this, it'll know that, it'll figure out that this query is in, uh, uh, this row is in shard uh, one and then send the query there. Uh, no rocket science there. Uh, if you do a select with an in clause, it'll actually know how to split it. It says, oh, uh, ID one is in shard zero, I'll send it to shard zero, and ID six is in shard one. I'll send it to shard one. So this demo actually uh, displays the queries it runs. Uh, so you can see what it's actually doing underneath. And um, let's see what else. You could do a select with nowhere clause. You'll say, oh, select with nowhere clause, no problem. I'll just send it to all shards and then gather the results. Now let's get, do some uh, more exciting stuff, which is uh, let's insert into music. So in this case, I'm using, uh, I'm inserting into music. I'm saying user ID value is one, uh, but there is no music ID because music ID will be auto-generated using the sequence. It should uh, work. Oh, it did. Uh, so uh, as you can see, it uh, created a, a user ID to music ID, and then it also created the lookup row, which, is, which maps the uh, music ID back to the user ID. Uh, let's see what's the next query. Oh, and then just to show, so now I'm going to insert um, a music ID row, a music row to user number four, who is in shard one, right? So if I did that, the music row lands up in shard one, uh, even though its music ID is two. So if you had hashed by music ID, it would have gone to shard zero instead. And uh, why does this work, and how does this work is, uh, I'll show you, uh, so, but then if you do a select, you select um, uh, from, music, uh, from music with user ID equal to one, it's just again simple hash sharding, it'll send it there. But if you select by music ID, it will uh, go to the music user lookup table, fetch the user ID, and then we'll know where to route uh, the actual query. So the, all this is kind of done under the covers, and with two PC, you don't have to worry about uh, atomicity of these transactions. There is a cost to two PC, so use it with care. And uh, finally, we can uh, now uh, insert into music extra, and music extra is going to use the lookup values that I already created uh, using uh, uh, the music row, to figure out where to insert rows into that query. So you can, uh, you can see how um, a relational model uh, maps better with this kind of thinking uh, for when you decide to uh, do your sharding. I am running out of time, so I will rush. <laughs> and uh, I'm now going to show you some joins. So here is a query. 
to save you time, what this query does is join uh, user with music on user ID. So we made the decision that the music rows will live with their users, which means that this is a single shot query. And if you send the query through, it says, there you go. I know that this query is a single shot query, so I'm just sending it to one. Instead, you could, uh, what is this one? If you did the same, uh, that, uh, that query also had a where user ID equal to two. This is actually, it doesn't have the where user ID equal to two, but Vita still knows that this query um, does not have cross shard dependencies, even though it has a join. So it actually scatters the join to all shards, gathers the results, and returns them back to you. Uh, here is a more complex one, where you are joining user ID with music extras other ID, and there is no key on other ID. So this has to be a cross shard query. So if you run this, uh, what it can do is do the first select on shard zero, uh, because user ID equal to two, use that result, and actually perform a scatter for the other query, because there is no key for uh, user extra. If you had defined the key, it would have used it to actually uh, fetch the target key space ID for it and then directed it to just uh, that particular shard. Um, and uh, so basically the way we designed these features is to actually cover 90% of most use cases that people have. We still have that last 10% to cover and as soon as I get out of this conference, I'll get to work on it. <laughs> so. And uh, before I, I leave you, since I promised to show you what we can do, is uh, so this is that same demo. Now I'm running a MySQL client. Select star from user. You can do use um, lookup. Show tables, boom, use user, show tables, show create table user. So it mostly behaves as if it's MySQL. Uh, you can easily break it, but uh, if you just want to get some things quickly done, um, this, this is, this is so. Um, uh, so this protocol is ready. We just released this, uh, released this in uh, 2.1, um, and uh, uh, and this demo is available for you to uh, download. Uh, a more extensive version of this is available for you to download and play with. So without further ado, let me give it back to Robert, who is at Stitch Labs, and is going to talk about the great stuff he did with it. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, yeah, like Sugu said, I work at Stitch Labs. I am a DevOps engineer there, and I was part of the team that migrated us from uh, an older scale or sharding solution to uh, Vitas. So this is going to basically talk about everything that we did to get that done. So really, in the beginning, um, this was really forced by the software that we were using called uh, Scalebase. It was bought out by another company and they basically just got rid of the software, so we were the only people in the world running this sharding solution, which is no bueno. Uh, that's not what you want to be doing. So that software, closed source, it had plenty of bugs, nobody was actively developing it, it was, it was not good. So really, we started the search to find something different. And in our evaluation, uh, we needed performance. At the time of our migration, last year in like September-ish, we were doing about 150,000 queries per second through our database infrastructure. And so it definitely needed to scale. And I figure if it works for YouTube, it'll probably work for us. The next part, um, it needed cross-shard queries. Uh, while there were a lot of bad things about the old software, it's cross-shard query support, top-notch. Uh, you could do limits, you can do joins, you can do all kinds of things with their cross-shard query support. And that was a crutch that we came to rely on. Um, VTES has this notion of a scatter query, which is similar, but it doesn't afford all of the same flexibilities, but it was close enough to get us by. Uh, the next bit that we needed was redundancy. Um, the old solution didn't really have too much of that baked in. You had a single master, and if that master went down, well, you're going to get a page, and it's going to be bad. 
Uh, VTES will let you have as much redundancy as your CFO will let you. You can set up as many replicas as you want. You can set up as many read-only nodes as you want. The, the, the pocketbook is the limit there. So that, that's a good part about that. And then we needed um, basically the sequence tables that Sugu was talking about um, to auto-increment our keys. Scalebase provided that for us. We needed that to get our application done. So now that we've decided on VTES, uh, what do we do? Well, first thing, back in the day, they didn't have MySQL protocol support like he demonstrated. That's pretty cool. We're likely going to migrate to that because we have to use this crazy thing called gRPC, which is awesome because it lets you connect systems, but debugging gRPC using like Wireshark or something is not the easiest thing in the world. Uh, so that really just kind of confused us a lot internally, like why do we need to do this? What is this? And so either way, we went through with it. Uh, at the time, the gRPC libraries for PHP were very just alpha beta quality. They weren't even a 1.0 release. Now they're better. I think they're 1.0.2 or something like that. So if you want to play with it, definitely just give it a try. And uh, one of our engineering mantras is just add the force flag and just make it happen. So dash dash force, we're going with it. The next one, um, Sugu and his team did a really, really good job of coming up with a bunch of crazy terms. Key spaces and tablets and serving graphs, reticulating spines, all kinds of crazy weird things um, that were like, what, are, what, are, what is all this? You read the documentation and you're just lost. Fortunately, they have a key terms page and if you go to the website, I highly recommend reading that before you read any documentation. Otherwise, you're going to be so confused, it's, it's intense. But it ends up working out. Now, the fun part. The business said, you get a team of six people and you got three months to get this done from start to finish. Good luck. Well, hold my beer, we'll figure this out. Um, one of the big hurdles that we initially ran into was this notion of contiguous shard ranges. With our old solution, we could take an account on one shard, and let's say it's account ID one, or 100, and we can put it on shard one, but that only held account IDs of like one through three. B-Test doesn't like that. It wants to have contiguous ranges. It, has to, it wants to have one through three on one shard, four through six on another. You can't intermingle the ranges in between shards. So we came up with uh, this static map tool that we contributed back to B-Test to allow us to do that. And basically what we did was we wrote a script that spit out some JSON that mapped all of our IDs in our existing shards to contiguous ranges that VTest likes to enjoy. And with that, we're able to reuse all of the built-in functionality for resharding, recombination, all the cool things that the VTest team built. So that makes migrations from whatever sharding solution that you have today into VTest much, much nicer. The next big one. How the hell are we even going to migrate this thing? Like, we have 12 shards running all these queries. People are actively using it. It's a SaaS application. It can't go down. It's a big mess. We spent a lot of time trying to figure out how we're going to migrate this. And uh, one of the easy solutions that was proposed by the VTest team was, why don't you just use the built-in MySQL replication? Sweet. That's a great idea. Problem. Our MySQL replicas don't keep up. We were writing so much data to the masters that everything just fell behind. Like it would fall behind within 10 minutes of reseeding a new slave. And so that, that plan was kind of out the door pretty quick. So what we ended up doing, uh, the devs wrote some sweet code to basically lock down shards and prevent writes to them. And we migrated individual shards at once. So we would isolate certain accounts that we had to migrate, send out a big email message saying, hey, we're going to have some maintenance and move those specific accounts on that one shard over to VTES. Uh, it was a pretty crazy week. Uh, we'd figure out the plan during the day. I'd go home at 3 p.m., fall asleep, wake up at 10, start migrating everything. It would finish at like 5 in the morning, and then we would redirect all the traffic for those shards to VTES. And we did that one by one, every single set of accounts over the course of like two weeks. So it was pretty crazy on my sleep schedule, but we got it done with as minimal downtime as we could get to it because we didn't have that replication. So now we're in VTest land. Um, there were definitely hiccups, for sure. Uh, and it wasn't actually with VTest. Uh, we decided to just cowboy this thing and go straight to production with Kubernetes. Um, it was good and bad. Uh, a lot of the things that Kubernetes gives you out of the box is very powerful, but 
for a new team that really hadn't played with Docker that much, we didn't usually use any orchestration, it was a really, really high learning curve. And so out of the box with some of the demos that the VTest guys provided, it basically creates naked containers or pods as they're called in, um, in Kubernetes. And the problem with that is if a host node or something goes down, you lose all those pods forever and that's not a good thing. So we replace the pods with this notion of a deployment in Kubernetes and basically what that does is it keeps those pods running even if a node drops out. If it drops out, Kubernetes will reschedule those pods to be recreated somewhere else and bring them back online for you, which is a really nice thing and that's really what you're supposed to be doing with Kubernetes. The next big one, um, Kubernetes has this notion of resources, so CPU and RAM allocations for each container. Out of the box, it's fairly conservative. It gives a lot of resources to each container. And we didn't know that up front. So like, we'd be packing containers onto nodes and then it would say, oh, I can't schedule anymore because I need more CPU. And you're looking at the graphs and it's like, well, you're using 2% CPU on your host. Why are you out of CPU? Well, we didn't have time to figure that out because we were on a schedule to migrate this thing. So we just added a whole bunch of hosts and it cost us a lot of money. And so after all of the dust had settled, and it's like, okay, cool, we tripled our infrastructure cost. Now we're gonna get that back down. Well, we had to change all the default allocations and if we would have known that up front, it would have saved us a lot of money, a lot of headache, and the CEO wouldn't have yelled at us nearly as much. The next big thing that we had to accommodate was the BI tools, the analytics. With Scalebase, you could run those cross-shard queries and they could be very advanced queries and it would work. Uh, we can't do that with VTest anymore. Uh, the scatter queries are very limited. So we run everything in Google's cloud and naturally we decided to go with the Google option. We use the built-in VTest Hadoop connector to ship all of our data into all of the data that needs to be queried into BigQuery and then we use a tool called Mode Analytics to connect to BigQuery so that the business can still run all of their BI analytics stuff and just keep them happy because they need to be able to run their reports, figure out our burn, the whole, whole nine. So that was a fun one. This one is near and dear to my heart. Um, there is a lot of automation that you can do with VTES. There is a really, really cool API that does so many things. And we use it very heavily for things like automated backups, automated upgrades, auto healing, and I mean like fully automated. The backup system that we have, it's a cool Python script that hooks up to the API and it reads the whole landscape of all of our containers and it figures out which one of those containers are read only for all of the shards. It plucks those guys out and says, all right, all of you guys, back up, poof, and they all back up magically. No impact to production, you don't slow down your writes, nothing happens, it just works. It's absolutely amazing. Initially, when we had to roll out updates, because these guys, oh man, you should see that GitHub repo. It is constantly committing. It is crazy. You fall out of sync in like two weeks flat, easy. So we had to automate our update process because these guys are just too awesome. And so we wrote some Python scripts that combined the Kubernetes APIs and the VTest APIs to facilitate that. We roll the new updated uh, Docker images with some of our magic sprinkles, and then we give it that URL to that registry object, put it in the script, and it will go through all of our instances and roll them so that the master gets moved to another um, container. That master is then updated, master is moved again, that new container is updated, and it round robins the whole thing in like a wave across our entire cluster with no downtime. You can only do this because of those APIs. Really, really slick, saves me a lot of headaches, and it's, it's amazing. Unfortunately, the API can't make sandwiches, so you're gonna have to look elsewhere for that, but we'll figure that out. All right, so some of the key takeaways that we got from our migration. If you're gonna use Kubernetes to do this thing, and I highly recommend that you do, learn it. Learn it well, understand it, just really try to understand what you're gonna be using in production. We're small, we're nimble, and like I said, dash, dash, force, we just went with it. Don't do that, just think about it a little bit more. Um, automation, that is super key on bigger fleets. Uh, we run 500 plus containers for our database infrastructure. Initially, I had big lists of text pads copied and pasted, regex to modify all the commands and running them manually. Don't do this, this is not the right way. Put your DevOps hat on, automate this, get the scripts out there, and just save yourself a lot of time and headaches. Um, and then run through the Kubernetes tutorials on the VTest site. They're actually really, really good, uh, but it 
it pays to run them a lot. I think before our migration, I personally went up and down with all of those tutorials at least 100 times using different permutations, modifying them, and really understanding what is my infrastructure going to do once I get it out to production. And because of that, I was able to really just make this work for Stitch and just have it work out of the box, and it was great. Um, if you can replicate out of your old database, do it. You can actually do your entire migration with pretty much no downtime if you're able to replicate out because of the way that some of the VTest tools work. So if we could have done that, we would have had no downtime to migrate our entire database. So that's a pretty cool thing. That's a big thing to keep in mind. Is we had that constraint, but if your companies don't have that constraint, ooh, you are in a very good situation. And then the last piece here, the VTest team is incredibly responsive on the mailing lists, on Slack, basically everywhere. Uh, I've seen Sugu on the weekends with me in Slack coding, trying to figure stuff out. I mean, it's pretty amazing how receptive that team is to the community, to feedback, to just understanding everything. And they really want you to feel welcome. You go into the Slack channel, you can ask basic questions, everybody will jump in to help you. It's not kind of nasty like some of those IRC channels that are like, go read the manual, get out of here. It's, it's very friendly, it's very helpful. So I mean, with that, I actually kind of want a round of applause for Sugu and his team right now, because they've really helped us make this transition. So with that, any questions for us? Yes. Ooh, uh, definitely going to be that MySQL protocol support. Um, it literally just dropped like a week ago, and we will likely migrate all of our gRPC code off of it to use that just because it simplifies our infrastructure a lot. And for my headache, I mean, I don't have to look at the wire traces that are gRPC. I can look at the MySQL protocol that I know and love and make it happen. Cool. Yeah. Oh, that was in the demo that you saw, right? Yeah. Oh, those, those are uh, uh, those are just uh, explanation as to what this query is trying to demonstrate. Yeah, it's just a query that you have to send. Uh, the example shows a lot of uh, queries, and you have you want to know like what is this? What is uh, which feature is this query demonstrating? Um, so that's that's what it is. Yes. Oh. Uh, actually, I've done that many, many, many a times. It's, it's really easy, actually. Um, they have built all the infrastructure to make this happen. You basically stand up your new destination shards, and you tell VTES about them. You say, hey, these are the new shards that I'm going to be putting into production, and this is the range that they're going to contain. They've written a tool called Split Clone, and basically what this will do is it will compare the destination shards to the shards that you already have, automatically, by itself, figure out where the data needs to go. It will read off of those shards and push it into whatever shards cover that new range and do all the splitting for you. But it gets even better. Once it copies all of the data, it actually keeps a live stream from the original shard to the new shards until you're ready to flip it over. You can go in, you can validate the data, you can make sure that there's a lot of, cons that everything is there, not missing, and then when you're ready, you can make the flip to move the traffic from the old master, the old shards, to the new ones that you had just set up. And it works both ways. You can split out and you can recombine. We've done both in production. Works fantastic. Yep, exactly, exactly. And it's very, very cloud friendly. I mean, we do it in containers. You just drop the containers and poof, you save the resources. You can do it one shard at a time if you yep. are short on resources. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. So the reason that it fixed that is because we went pretty gung-ho with our migration. Um, we set up a VTest client on our old SQL masters and presented that to VTest, and it looked like it was a VTest master, and we sucked all of the data out and split it right away into five separate shards. And when you do that, the, the query load across all five is much, it's, it's divide by five across the thing, and all your replication starts working because you split the load pretty substantially. So that's how we made it happen. And it's been caught up ever since. We use SemiSync in production, 
and that kind of forces things to slow down a little bit, but it ensures a lot of data consistency. Oh, so the answer is Vitesse tries to send as much as possible work to MySQL, uh, and, uh, uh, and once it goes to MySQL, then it's standard MySQL RDBMS optimization. Uh, the one area where it helps is it actually groups uh, your queries by their unique string and uh, gives you a, a good report on uh, what kinds of queries are taking how long, which we use a lot in our production. Uh, when, whenever there is trouble, uh, we look at the query chart and we know, oh, there's this new query that has popped up or the QPS on this particular query has gone up. Uh, so that is uh, one area. And uh, for cross shard, we have similar tools on VT gates, I believe, right? Uh, to oh, you are on the MySQL side, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, so basically, uh, the uh, Vitesse exports a bunch of stats on um, uh, uh, either both in terms of query performance and in terms of uh, uh, various numbers about latency per shard latency uh, per. Um, yeah, uh, query volume, latency, um, whether or not they're healthy, a whole bunch of stuff. There's, it's a great dashboard. I think I, we're going to get kicked out here, but if you have further questions, I'm willing to stick around and answer them. So, yep. Thank have you a very great much. Day.